TLS is go for all. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Atlantis onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 20 seconds. T minus 15. 12. 11. 10. 9. 8. 7. We have a go for main engine. 5. 4. 3. 2. 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, extending America's presence in space while opening new chapters in exploration. Houston now controlling. Houston now controlling. Control. Roll program initiated. Place Atlantis on its heads down track over the Atlantic. Engines at 104 percent, preparing the throttle down to 67 percent for max Q, passing through the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Three engines throttling down now. Three engines at 67. the water spray boiler quantity message. Three engines at 67 now passing through maximum aerodynamic pressure at 58 seconds. Atlantis moving at 1,000 miles per hour now. Altitude 8.8 .8 miles, downrange 5.8 miles. Atlantis, go at throttle up. Go at throttle up and we'll ignore the fuel cell delta V also. Three engines back at 104%. Now Atlantis moving at 1,600 miles per hour. Atlantis, that is a deucer. Copy and concur. Three good fuel cells, three good APUs, three engines running at 104%. Atlantis now moving at over 2,000 miles per hour, 18.4 miles in altitude, downrange 16 miles. About 15 seconds away from solid rocket booster separation. Atlantis moving at 2,800 miles per hour. Have solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance converging. Performance nominal. Hard to believe that was 23 years ago. You never forget riding on the shuttle, but wow, STS-86, it was a beautiful launch. So thanks for joining me this evening uh, for this virtual event. Uh, it's fun for me to have an opportunity to share one of my favorite stories and to tell you more about what we did on SDS-86, but more importantly, what we did as part of the shuttle MIR program. So sit back, relax for a little bit. I'll share this really, really fun story. And at the end, I'll give you all an opportunity to ask me some questions. So with that, let's get started. To truly tell you the story, however, I need to go back in time. There's really some foundation, some groundwork I need to lay so you truly understand the significance of what we were doing during STS-86. And our missions to Mir is what we called the Shuttle Mir program. So like a lot of astronauts around my age, we'll tell you. For us, it really was all about the Apollo program. For me personally, in July of 1969, I had just turned 10 years old when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin got out and took those very historic first steps on the moon. And you know, to this day, I still can't tell you exactly what it was about lying in front of my black and white television at home, watching them do that but I was absolutely amazed. I could not take my eyes off that television screen. And as a 10 year old, I thought, that's it. That's what I wanna do when I grow up. 
I want to be an astronaut too. I want the chance to fly in space. So even though I didn't see anybody who looked like me doing that, I decided I still wanted to dream that dream. And that's the great thing about being a young kid. You just dream that dream. You don't stop to think about, hmm, what steps do I need to take to make this dream come true? Well, as I got to my later years of high school, I still was very much possessed by this dream. And I knew it was time to start thinking about what steps I needed to take to make this dream come true. And my dad gave me some pretty simple advice. Very good advice, however. He said, well, why don't you take a look at what the first groups of astronauts did before they got selected by NASA? What steps did they take to get there? What did they do after high school? Did they go to college? What did they study? Did they go into the military? Well, a lot of those astronauts, uh, well, all of them actually had gone to college. Many had studied engineering. A lot had gone into the military. And in my family, going to the Naval Academy and learning how to fly, that was somewhat family tradition. That's what my mom's dad did. That's what my dad did. So like them, I headed off the United States Naval Academy. But unlike them, after graduation, I thought, I really want to fly helicopters. Because for me, there's just something magical about flying sideways and backwards and staying over one spot. And life as a Navy helicopter pilot in any day, and one day you could be a combination of a Uber driver, Amazon delivery driver, you might be a Domino's pizza delivery driver as well. I just love the wide variety of missions that we had. And I love the fact that I was always part of a team. Myself, another pilot, two air crewmen, working together, trying to make sure we were making good decisions. We were trying to figure out the safest way to accomplish our mission. All of that was great preparation for life as an astronaut. Well, I finished the Naval Academy in 1981 and immediately headed off to flight training and I got to my first squadron in 1983. And all of that time was considered the Cold War. So here in the United States, you could say that tensions were pretty high between us and then Soviet Union. I did some deployments through the Mediterranean. We were often followed by Soviet naval warships. I did a couple of deployments up to the North Atlantic as well. Regularly, we were overflown by Soviet aircraft, followed immediately thereafter by aircraft from the United States. So literally, we watched the tension of the Cold War play out in the skies over our head. And if you were serving in the military for either country at that point in time, you did not want to end up in the other country because you would have been there for one reason and one reason only. And that was to go to war against them. That's what we had been trained to do. But after I finished my first shuttle flight, I did in fact find myself in Russia, more specifically in Star City, the formerly secret cosmonaut training base outside of Moscow. And the reason for me being there started several years before this picture was taken. When President Clinton was in office, as a part of his foreign policy initiative, he extended an invitation to the Russian Space Agency, now Russia, no longer the Soviet Union. He gave them an invitation to participate in the International Space Station program. Well, in the early days of President Clinton's time in office, Honestly, most of the modules of the International Space Station, what we call the ISS, they were still drawings on a piece of paper. NASA had only started to begin some of the first modules that were to launch. And so there really wasn't a way for NASA to immediately engage the Russian Space Agency in the International Space Station program. NASA was trying to figure out a more immediate way to start working with the Russians on a daily basis. And I don't know who, but somebody at NASA came up with an idea to initially have five NASA astronauts go up to the Russian space station Mir and spend anywhere from about three to six months on board. What was called phase one of the International Space Station program with the launch of the space, International Space Station being phase two. We just called it the Shuttle Mir program. 
So myself and a couple of my astronaut classmates, after we finished our first shuttle flights, we volunteered to participate in the Shuttle Mir program because we realized that space stations, that was gonna be NASA's future. So the fun part of this story starts with a classmate of mine by the name of Scott Pierzynski. Now Scott had flown his first shuttle flight just a couple of months before I was slated to blast off on my first launch. And after he finished that mission, he was to go over to Star City to train as a backup crew member for one of those five NASA flights to Mir. So Scott shows up in Star City and the Russians look at him and they go, oh my goodness, Scott, we had no idea that you're such a tall guy. He said, well, yeah, I'm about 6'3". And they sized him up again and went, hmm, Scott, you really are rather tall. In fact, you actually might be too tall for our crew transport vehicle, the Soyuz. Well, the Russians kind of took their time. They let Scott start going to classes. He's studying the systems on board Mir. Finally, they get around to putting Scott in what's called the Soyuz measuring device, literally a device to see whether or not you can fit in the seat on board Soyuz. And sure enough, Scott was too tall. He didn't fit Soyuz. So back he goes to the Johnson Space Center in Houston with a new nickname, Too Tall. Meanwhile, while all this has been playing out, I finished my first shuttle flight. I'm also designated to be a backup crew member for one of those missions to Mir. I start going to Russian language class at the Johnson Space Center, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day, trying to beat one word into my head at a time. And I get to the point where I'm about four days away from getting on the plane to fly to Moscow and then head out to Star City to start training. When the Russians sent the chief of the astronaut office a memo saying, in order to fly on board Soyuz, you had to be 164 centimeters tall. Well, it just so happens that I'm 160 centimeters right on the nose. So now the astronaut office also had a two short. And together, Scott and I were known as the Russian rejects. Well, one day Scott and I literally ran into one another in the hallway of our office building. And we're both, were trying to maintain a good attitude about all this. But independently, Scott and I had started to hear some rumors that NASA was thinking about adding two more of its astronauts to those long duration missions on Mir. And Scott and I were smart enough to realize that more long duration astronauts on Mir meant more shuttle flights flying there. So we held out hope at that point in time that we could at least fly to Mir together as members of a shuttle crew. Well, since I had been studying Russian and was willing to go over and live in Star City, the chief of the astronaut office at that time, Bob Cabana, he came back to me and said, well, I'd like to stick with most of the plan. I still wanna send you over to Star City, but instead of you being a backup crew member, how about you serve as NASA's Director of Operations in Russia, a job that's called the DOR. So that brings us to the point in time when this picture was taken, March of 1996. I've just arrived in Star City to start my six month stay as the DOR. Now I was still on active duty in the Navy, as I mentioned before. So this was really an experience that I never thought that I would have living in Russia, especially being in Red Square. So let me tell you another story about an astronaut who was also training as a backup crew member. Jim Voss, in his younger days in the United States Army, he had been an Army Ranger. So one day Jim and I went to tour around Red Square and I paused and I looked at Jim and I said, Jim, did you ever think when you were a second lieutenant in the Army that you'd be in Russia one day? And he turned to me with a very serious expression on his face and said, yeah, I did. But I figured I would be riding in on top of our tank after we had kicked the Soviet Union's butt. For the military astronauts and over half of the astronauts participating in the shuttle Mir program as crew members to go to Mir or backups, we'd either been in the military 
or was still on active duty in the military. So this was a dramatic change for us. Previously, it had been our mission to go a war against the Russians. Now our new directive was to turn them into partners, colleagues, people that we were gonna work very closely with. And fortunately for us, we had an example we could turn to. The building you're looking at here in Star City is called the Prophylactorium. Historically, it's been used as a quarantine facility for the cosmonauts going to and from the variety of space stations the Russians have had in their very rich history. On the second floor, it now houses the DOR office. But originally, this building was constructed to support the training of the crews who participated in the Apollo-Soyuz test program. And those were the astronaut and cosmonauts that we looked to as an example. And what we learned from them, what made their program successful, was the cosmonauts and the astronauts, they realized that even though really they didn't speak the same language, in many ways they did speak the same language. It was the language of spaceflight. We both had the same job, to train for a mission, to ride a rocket, and complete that mission in space. So like the Apollo-Soyuz astronauts and cosmonauts, the shuttle Mir astronauts and cosmonauts, we chose to focus on what we had in common, that language of spaceflight, being space flyers. We grabbed onto that and we chose not to let other things that we could perceive as differences separate us. So we grabbed on to that common denominator and we let that be the glue of the program. And slowly but surely we worked together to build a foundation that the rest of the program was built upon. And honestly, we loved living in Star City. It's about 60 kilometers to the Northeast of Moscow, far enough away that you're in the middle of this very large forest as you can see from these pictures and absolutely beautiful uh, setting. In the summertime, once the weather got warm, people would come out with their pasty white skin and line the banks of that small lake in front of the prophylactorium just to work on some vitamin D. In the wintertime, breathtaking, probably one of the most beautiful and peaceful things I've done in my life is to go cross-country skiing out through that forest to get to the point where you could hear no man-made sound. And of course, always on a on display and very proudly displayed statue of Yuri Gagarin, uh, Russian cosmonaut, first human in space. The Russians have many reasons to be very, very proud of what they accomplished in their space program. And it was also amazing to have an opportunity to learn that rich history firsthand by being in Star City. So let me pick up with some more of this story. I'm working as the DOR. NASA, uh, at that point in time, officially makes the decision to add two more of those uh, long duration flights, to have two more of its astronauts go up and do those multi-month missions on board Mir. And the Russians know that I'm interested in being one of those crew members. So one day they come to me and they say, well, we probably should actually measure you to see if you fit in Soyuz. So they arrange that. They put me in the Soyuz measuring device and to their amazement, I'm actually the perfect size to fly on board Soyuz. But they said, oh, not so fast. If you're gonna go on board Mir and live there for months at a time, we wanna make sure that you can fit in our version of the spacewalking suit. That suit is called the Orlon. So they arranged what's called a fit check for me, meaning they put me in the suit, they closed it up, they pressurized it, and they wanted to see if the suit fit. Took me about a minute to realize, nope, the suit doesn't fit at all. In fact, the suit is so big on me that I was actually able to slide both arms of my arms back out of the suit arms and scratch my nose with both hands, which I demonstrated for the suit test technicians. They'd never seen anybody be able to do this before and they thought this was hilariously funny. They literally fell on the floor laughing Finally, they got up, and then we then had a serious conversation out after they got me out of the suit. I'm shaking my head back and forth vehemently saying, no way. 
absolutely no way could I go out and do a walk in that suit. I said, I have a problem. It's a rather significant problem. I said, this thing is so big on me that I actually can't get both of my hands down in the gloves of the suit at the same time. I said, I kind of have to rock back and forth, meaning I got one hand in the suit glove and the other hand is not anywhere close to that glove. So there's no way in the world I can go outside and do a hand over hand translation on the handrails. I just can't grab onto them. Way too dangerous. They agreed. But again, knowing that I wanted to do one of these long duration flights, the Russians thought about it for a couple weeks and they came back to me with a proposal. They said, all right, once you finish this DOR, we'll let you start training for a mission to Mir. In fact, we'll let you do that mission on Mir, provided you are never in a situation in which you need to be able to do a spacewalk with one of your cosmonaut crewmates. I thought that was fair, as did my management chain. So the Russians, you know, again, gave me that waiver and a decision was made that once I finished my time as DOR, I could start training for my mission to Mir and the plan that I would launch on STS-86, that shuttle flight would take me to Mir, deliver me there, and I would come back to Earth on STS-89. Well, let me quickly introduce you to some of the NASA astronauts who were in the shuttle Mir program at this point in time. If you look at the guy in the blue suit holding a kid, Mike Fole. He was going to be the fifth NASA crew member to fly on Mir. We called him the NASA 5 crew member. Next to Mike, Jim Voss. Jim was Mike's backup. Jim actually ended up being on the second crew to live and work on board the ISS. I am next to Jim. I was going to be the NASA 6 crew member. Down below me, squatting with the white patch on his suit and the white uh, turtleneck, Dave Wolf. He would be the seventh and final NASA crew member. And next to him, his backup, Andy Thomas. So honestly, I was really happy to put the, the DOR hat down to take that admin hat off and start being an operational crew member again and start training. And I have to tell you that training in Russia, particularly the survival training you do, is very realistic because it's based on scenarios that have happened to cosmonauts coming back from some of the earliest space stations the Russians had. So we had to do winter survival training because the Soyuz kind of rotates around the year and large parts of Russia are very, very cold in the winter time. So we had to be prepared for a landing in the winter time. And what we were gonna do was based on what had happened to an early cosmonaut crew. They were coming back in the winter time. And unfortunately for them, as they came back into the scent module of Soyuz, they had a little bit of a problem with their guidance system, meaning they were coming down off course, not necessarily gonna land in the middle of the designated landing zone. Also unfortunate for the crew was the fact that the weather in the general landing zone area was horrible. It basically was a blizzard. So they land off course in the middle of a blizzard and for 24 hours, nobody could find them and they had to fend for themselves until eventually the rescue forces were able to get to us. So that was a scenario that we would practice. And the Russians said, huh, we don't think it's cold enough for you in Star City. We are going to put you on an airplane. We're gonna fly about six hours away to the Northeast of Russia, to a part of Russia that's so far away and so remote that we actually don't even think of it as being Siberia anymore. We call it the Kriny Sever or the extreme North. So here we landed at a uh, Russian Air Force base. I remember getting off the plane and looking around and it dawned on me that, wow, nothing above the surface of the snow is a living plant. We were there in March. During the day, the temperature was a balmy minus 30 degrees Celsius. And then again, the scenario that we would practice, coming down, having to fend for ourselves until our rescue forces could find us. So the first night we could spend in the descent module of Soyuz, which you can see there in the picture. Next day and night, we were on our own in the elements. So our Russian instructor said, you should probably know how to build an igloo. Uh, this is the igloo that the instructors built as an example. Myself and my two crewmates, we got up about two thirds of the way 
with our igloo and couldn't for the life of us figure out how to make a roof of the igloo work. So we gave up on that idea. We try, tried a snow cave. We lasted about 20 minutes. We gave up on that idea because we were way too cold. And then we then spent the rest of the day walking up and down the banks of the very frozen Lena River, chiseling out driftwood from the ice and dragging it back to camp. And that became our plan. We lit a fire, we huddled by it all night long. And unfortunately for my crew, it got pretty windy overnight. And with the wind speeds we had, we estimated our wind chill to be minus 50 degrees Celsius. I have never been so cold in my life. And honestly, I never want to be that cold again. Well, we finished winter survival training and the Russians come back to me and say, hey, don't worry. Your next survival training, water survival, better deal because we're going to send you down to the Black Sea in June. It's going to be warm, wonderful, almost like being on a vacation. I said, sure, whatever. I just want to get it done. And again, we would practice the scenario that had happened to a returning crew of cosmonauts. And this time they were coming back in, in the rainy season. I should mention the descent module actually returns and lands in Kazakhstan. And so somehow this crew managed to land in the middle of a small lake, something the rescue forces had not yet seen. And they were a little frantic. They didn't know if the capsule would continue to sink before they were able to figure out a way to get the crew out. Fortunately, it was all good. The capsule floated, the crew was recovered. But this was a scenario, again, we needed to practice with our rescue forces. So there in the upper picture, I'm dressed in the Russian version of the launch and entry suit called Sokol. I got down into the scent module with my two crewmates. Module got lowered into the water. Inside, we had to change into our water survival gear and then climb up through the hatch, jump into the water, inflate our life preservers, dig out our flares, fire them off so the helicopter could rescue us. So finally, survival training is done. Happy to have that behind me. At that point in time, I've got about 12 weeks left on the planet. And the Russian control center outside of Moscow decided to conduct a test. And they wanted to see if the cosmonaut commander on board Mir could manually redock or manually dock the progress resupply rocket at Mir. And when I say manually, they didn't want him to use the standard rendezvous radar system, which would have provided him information about how fast progress was approaching Mir. That's what we call closure rate. Instead, they wanted to see if he could figure that out on his own by simply monitoring views of progress in an onboard video monitor as progress was approaching Mir. So he tries to do this. He's watching progress get closer and closer, trying to determine that closure rate. And progress gets a point where it's pretty close to Mir and he realizes progress is coming way too fast. So he frantically sends commands to progress, trying to get it to slow down and fly around Mir. Too little, too late. Progress actually hit the solar rays attached to the spectrum module. There you can see a close-up of the damage. Progress then bounced off the arrays and hit the radiator panel on the side of Spectre. Again, a close-up of the damage. So on board, three crew members, two cosmonauts and Mike Full. Initially, they feel a series of collision. A few minutes later, they start to feel their ears pop, which was a direct indication to them that they had a cabin leak, a very serious situation. They knew immediately if they couldn't figure out where that leak was coming from, they were going to have to get on board Soyuz and abandon Mir and come back down to Earth. They start that frantic search. They eventually figure out the leak is from Spectre and they were able to close the hatch to the Spectre module and seal off the leak. By doing that, they saved the Mir space station. But they still were not in a great situation. As you saw, Spectre had solar arrays. Solar arrays capture sunlight, they convert it into electricity. When they closed the hatch, they lost the use of the Spectre solar arrays. And the remaining solar arrays on board Mir were not generating enough electricity to power all of the essential systems on board Mir. Again, not a great situation. It was causing some power outages and some damages to the system. It was causing Mir to slowly rotate and not be able to maintain its attitude. 
So again, not a great situation. And the Russian control center realized that they desperately needed to recover use of the Spectre solar arrays. They thought about that, they thought about that for a few weeks and came up with a plan. And that plan required the next crew going to Mir, two cosmonauts and the next NASA astronaut, they would need to be able to do a series of spacewalk in the Russian spacesuit. So suddenly I was too short again. And STS-86 went from this to this. My backup Dave was gonna fly in my place. Thanks to Bob Cabana, he was gonna let me stay on STS-86 just as a shuttle crew member, meaning we'd blast off, dock with Mir, spend a few days, and then I would come back down to Earth. So as you can see, the patch had already been made. They'd been designed, they'd been made. NASA had thousands of them. So what do you do when you have a last minute crew change? Little inside story on the patch, that they're literally they made a tab and sewed them onto all those patches. With Dave's Wolf down there, we called that, um, Dave's name on there, we called that the payload deployed tab. And we jokingly said that once we left Dave on Mir, we'd fold it back up and uh, leave Dave behind and go back to the original patch. You also, you know, need to change things like photos. But I should mention before that, maybe some of you were sharp and you picked up on the fact that that patch had the name Perizinski. So yes, as we had wondered long ago and wished about, too tall and too short, the Russian rejects, we did end up as crew members on board SDS-86. Taking pictures, crew photo already done. What do you do when one of your crew members is up in space, Mike Full, and the other crew member is in Russia? No way able to come back to Johnson Space Center yet just to take a simple crew photo. Again, I'll let you in on the inside story. You see Dave Wolf there. That's Dave's head. That's not Dave's body. That's actually one of our suit techs, Troy, who posed in our launch and entry suit in the right position so digitally his body and Dave's head could be added to the picture. It was pretty frantic getting added to a crew at the last minute. I have to say my training went pretty smoothly, but I guess it was unrealistic for us as a shuttle crew to expect that everything else would go smoothly. With the damage that had been done to Mir, that problem of Mir not being able to maintain a precise attitude of slowly drif drifting in space, that persisted. So for the first time ever, the shuttle crew, the four members of the crew in particular who were on what we call the rendezvous team, the group of crew members who were tasked with bringing the shuttle orbiter to a docking at Mir, they had to figure out how to dock with a rotating space station. It is challenging enough just to join two spacecraft together. Picture this situation. We are about 240 miles above the Earth's surface, going roughly 1,700, 17,500 miles an hour. That's five miles a second, eight kilometers a second. Both vehicles weigh an incredible amount. The orbiter at docking was about 100 tons. You had to very precisely navigate the two spacecraft together, maintain alignment to within a couple of inches in order for the docking mechanisms to actually latch together. And you had to do it at a very controlled rate of approach, typically no more than 0.1 feet per hour, per second, excuse me. Imagine doing that though, if one of the vehicles is rotating. Real credit to the strength of the NASA rendezvous experts. They figure out a mechanism by which we could have the vehicle, the orbiter rotate if necessary to match Mir. And here is the guidance computer that we desperately needed to get up to Mir um, to replace and make sure that no other shuttle crew faced the situation. You got to see launch, another quick picture. What you didn't see from the video is when we drove out to that launch pad, it was actually raining, lightning, thundering, 
raining sideways, it was so hard. We really didn't think we were going to launch that day, but magically the clouds cleared and we got to blast off at about 1030 at night. A nice picture of our orbiter Atlantis as seen from Mir and Mir as seen from Atlantis. It was great to finally be on board after months of training in Star City to see Mir with my own eyes, to mix the two crews together. And 86, the shuttle crew, was really a sign of things to come and for NASA in both uh, the rest of the shuttle Mir program and the ISS crews. And by that, I mean we were a crew that was pretty international in our composition. We had a Russian cosmonaut flying with us, Vladimir Titov. We also had an astronaut representing the European Space Agency, Jean-Luc Chrétien. It was a busy mission. We had a spacewalk to do. There were some experiments we were gonna cover from the outside of Mir. There were techniques we needed to test for upcoming ISS assembly flights. And this was a historic spacewalk. Scott Perzinski got to go out on his first spacewalk and he was teamed with Vladimir Titov, the first time a non-NASA astronaut had ever put on the NASA spacewalking suit. And this was Vladimir's fourth opportunity to do a spacewalk. About midway through that spacewalk, Scott took a break and happened to come up by the front part of the orbiter payload bay and he had his gold visor down. So I just had to grab the camera to take this view just an incredible view of Mir, the orbiter, and the Earth reflected in the background. I was pretty busy as well. Uh, even though I didn't have a lot of responsibilities as part of the shuttle crew, I knew once we got to Mir, I needed to set up the Proto Laboratory module for Dave. He hadn't had time to train on all the NASA six experiments I had, so that was my contribution to Dave's mission to get him up and running by setting up all those experiments. And one last chapter of the too tall, too short Russian reject saga. Scott and I had a moment where we both took a break and floated over to the Soyuz, climbed inside, and here's a great picture of the two of us looking through the, the hatch of the Soyuz. Quick view of the inside of the Russian base block, the inside of Mir. Partnering the Space Shuttle Orbiter with the Mir Space Station really was a great idea. The Space Shuttle Orbiter had the ability to get a lot to space and a lot back home as well. And when you study the history of the Russian program, historically one of the things they've never developed is the ability to get large pieces of equipment back to Earth. And so that's what we developed, uh, that's what we were able to do for the Russians is to bring all that back, to bring the broken equipment back to them. And, um, over the course of the nine shuttle docking flights, we cleaned up Mir, we cleaned up that clutter and the Russians then reused all that equipment in the ISS program. They were pretty efficient that way. Honestly, it was a little bittersweet to leave Dave behind to know that I should have been there in his place, but not all that bittersweet because not a lot of people knew that uh, as soon as I landed and got done with STS-86, I was literally gonna start training for STS-91 the last docking flight to Mir. Here you can see the 91 crew, again, a uh, international crew. We had a Russian cosmonaut with us. So fun to be back on Mir and uh, to be a part of the final shuttle docking flight there. And this mission did provide me with one of the most surreal moments that I've had in my life. Um, when I was a young Naval officer, I mentioned that I never thought I would be in Russia one day. And at that point in my life, I also never thought I would be selected as an astronaut. And if I did end up as an astronaut, I never thought that I would be on board a Russian space station floating around one evening singing Beatles songs in English with a Russian cosmonaut. Talgut Musabayev, commander of Mir on the last flight there, loves to play the guitar, loves the Beatles. And so thanks to Mission Control in Houston, the lyrics to several Beatles songs were sent up to us. And yes, we sang. This picture fittingly was taken on SDS-91, last, again, last shuttle flight to Mir. The sun was setting, casting long shadows across the earth, but enough sunlight left to illuminate the full moon and the white modules of Mir. The shuttle Mir program did exactly what it was intended to do. It gave NASA an opportunity to start working closely with the Russian Space Agency. 
And I think if you asked the shuttle meter astronauts back when we were doing this program, what our lasting impact would be, the fact that we had laid the foundation for the ISS and that we were coming up nearly on 20 years of continuous occupation of this amazing vehicle. I don't think any of us would tell you that we would have been as successful as we were. As I mentioned before, we chose to overlook the perceived differences. We focused on what we had in common and we used that to literally become the backbone of the International Space Station program. Yes, we chose to collaborate. Halting steps at first, but we persisted. And now international space flight, it's the norm. And I wanna end with this picture because it's very representative of what we've been able to accomplish first through Shuttle Mir and now with the International Space Station program. In this picture, you have a NASA astronaut, a European Space Agency astronaut, Canadian, Japanese, and a couple of Russian cosmonauts as well. This is the way of the future. And I think when people look back at both Shuttle Mir and the ISS, and they look at what the most significant contribution of both those programs, what it will be, and it will be this, the international collaboration. The fact that when we choose to focus on what we have in common, and when we choose to ignore what we choose to see as perceived differences, we can accomplish some amazing things. And I think this will always be one of the highlights of my astronaut career, being part of this collaboration. So with that, I have offered you all an opportunity to ask me some questions and we're gonna get started with that. And I have a question here from Dan. What was your thought when you looked back on Earth when you've got to space? That is something that you absolutely never forget. Um, that first view out the window. It's an incredibly beautiful planet. And honestly, I don't think the cameras do justice. But for me, it was the end of a 25 year pursuit of a dream. You know, we were out over the ocean and the sun was shining off of it. And that's the moment where it really hit me that, wow, I'm in space. The dream has come true. What an incredible, incredible moment to experience. It was far better than I anticipated to be. Incredibly moving moment. And really one of my most favorite things to do is to grab a little window time and watch our incredibly beautiful planet. Um, it never gets boring to me. And it, we get to see it in an amazing way. And it truly is a privilege to have that opportunity. So Ella would like to know, how do you keep going on those really tough days in training and not give up? This is actually something I learned at the Naval Academy. Uh, that, you know, what do you do? What, do you, that, what is that source of motivation gonna be? Because the Naval Academy, well, that was hard. Studying engineering in particular, all the professional training that you had to do, you never felt like you had enough time. I perpetually always felt like I was behind. And I knew I needed a source of motivation. I knew I needed a visual reminder of what, uh, where I wanted to be. I was realistic though. I was like, let's focus one step at a time. For me, the next immediate step was to graduation, to go to flight training and become a, a naval aviator. So I went to the store and I bought a set of naval aviator wings, gold wings that I put on the cork board we had in our room. But that was my visual reminder. When I got tired of doing all my problem sets, working on homework, studying for tests, I would take a moment and I would look at those wings. And that was my reminder of the next step I wanted to take. So I think it's important to have something that can serve as that motivator for you, that reminder. I think it's also important to find a support system. Surround yourself with people who are willing to be your cheerleaders, people who believe in you, who want to walk alongside you particularly when you're in that low spot and they want to kind of grab one arm and help you move along your journey. So Logan, apart from survival training, what was the most difficult part of your training? I 
want to take a moment to say, there's not much that matches just how difficult that winter survival training was. When it's minus 50 degrees Celsius, it's hard to put into words just how cold that is. And honestly, incredibly effective as survival training because I literally felt like, okay, I gotta just last one more minute. And that was my mindset. Hang on for one more minute, one more minute. So definitely tough to do that. When I finished it, you know, that was one of those situations where you go, wow, if I could go through that, I, I think I can go through a lot in life. What was really challenging was trying to train for a space flight in another language. The wealth of information that you need to know when you prepare for a mission, it can be daunting, it can be overwhelming. So imagine trying to learn that information in a language that is not your native tongue. That also was incredibly challenging. And fortunately, I had a wonderful Russian language instructor in Star City who really helped me progress through my language skills and develop them. And I think without her, it would have been a task that I just would have not been successful at. Martin asks, uh, what's it like when the rocket ship is about to take off? <laughs> Never a boring ride. Um, there's a sense of anticipation and excitement. Um, first time you do it, you don't know exactly what to expect because honestly, there is no simulator down here on planet Earth that can simulate the 6.5 million pounds of thrust you experience when you rode the shuttle. We had done some uh, training in the simulator the centrifuge in particular, but when all the rocket engines lit off and the two solid rocket boosters oh, kick in the chest, you knew the moment you left the launch pad because it's like you've been put in the world's biggest slingshot and somebody let go. And then about 30 seconds after liftoff, you're experiencing 3G. So this incredibly heavy sensation on your chest. And I remember thinking on my first flight, like, oh my gosh, you just sat down on me. I can't breathe. I also couldn't put my arm out in front of me. The rocket was just so powerful. So at that point I thought, you know, I'm gonna lie here. I'm gonna enjoy the ride. And it is just a dramatic, dramatic experience. And again, one that you just never get tired of experiencing. Oh, question from Jeff Campbell. Hey Jeff, my buddy. We went to the Naval Academy together. Thanks for joining me tonight. Uh, what sort of things occupy your current days apart from uh, hand washing and social distancing? Definitely a lot of hand washing and social distancing and mask wearing. You know, for me, uh, wearing a mask has just always been part of the job. When you're a NASA astronaut, you learn to fly in the T-38 jet. Uh, you had to put on your oxygen mask, so no big deal. I'm pretty passionate about working with kids. When I think about my story, um, growing up in Southern California during the height of the Vietnam War, I didn't mention the fact that my dad, naval aviator, was actually a prisoner of war in Vietnam at that point in time. So I pretty much grew up in a single parent household. You know, growing up in the Southern California in the late 1960s, I just look back and think of all the way is that my life could have just gone off in a very different direction but I was possessed by that dream. So I know the power of a dream, the power of a dream to motivate you, to propel you, to keep you moving forward down your path, even though you don't think you have what it takes. And so that's what I wanna share with kids is that you can pursue those same opportunities. Don't let perceived obstacles stand in your way. Don't sell yourself short. I mean, if I can do it, you can do it. And so I wanna work with those kids. I wanna make sure they have opportunities um, like designing an experiment to be flown on the International Space Station as part of a program called Go for Launch Higher Orbits. I want kids to have those opportunities. I want them to realize that they have what it takes within them to start down that path in pursuit of their dream. So I do a lot of STEM uh, outreach, STEM advocacy work as well in a group of uh, former female astronauts, we've just formed a nonprofit organization called Astra Femina to work as uh, and serve as role models for young uh, girls and women who are also interested in pursuing STEM careers. So 
very enjoyable work. It's uh, my way of giving back and it's my way of thanking everybody who played a role in helping my dream come true. Ah, Carolina, I think. Another higher orbit student. Um, you think that my experience with height challenges is a good reflection of other astronaut struggles as well? Uh, with the way such a minor detail could hold you back from a mission. You know, one of the things I realized is, you know, you've got to be persistent. Um, another thing I realized is you don't always have to take no as an answer. My high challenges started uh, with my Navy flight training. Um, you know, there were a lot of aircraft that the Navy wouldn't let me fly. They almost didn't get into flight training, but I just was not going to take a no for an answer. I was going to figure out, and I did figure out a way to overcome those obstacles. And so sometimes you just have to keep asking questions. You've got to persist. You've got to also try and see if you can solve the problem on your own. And I think that's a lot of life. Um, you look at a particular situation, it doesn't seem like you're going to be able to do it. How do you get around that obstacle? Just because somebody's done it a particular way, is that the only way it can be done? Is there another way that can be done that's going to be better suited for who you are, whatever size you have, whatever personality you have? And I think more importantly, what I've learned over the years is ask for help. You do not have to do all of this on your own. So there's nothing wrong with reaching out to people because, again, there are a lot of people in your life who want to help you succeed. There's nothing wrong with reaching out to them and seeing if they would be willing to help you solve this problem, to be part of that support system that I talked about earlier. Got a question here from Maddie. Have they ever or will work on nuclear science in space? Because she wants to work in that field. You know, we have kind of flirted with nuclear power in the space world for decades, because when you send a probe to a far off location and you want it to be powered for a long period of time, that's really the best option that we have available. You know, the farther you get away from the sun, you know, the less able you are going to be to rely on solar power as a source of um, power for the rest of the spacecraft. So NASA is looking at nuclear power again um, to propel some of its uh, vehicles, particularly when we start to head in the direction of Mars and we want to have astronauts live on the surface. It really is one of the most efficient power sources that we can use uh, for that sort of mission. So I would tell you, you can look at the NASA website right now and you'll already see that NASA is uh, going to continue to pursue power sources that uh, rely on various types of um, nuclear. All right. From Dan, when you're doing the rendezvous and other maneuvers, uh, how did my helo training compare contrast with orbital mechanics and was it intuitive? Well, orbital mechanics is a different beast. And I'll tell you what actually prepared me for that was having a chance to go back to the Naval Academy and teach physics. And so that's part of the physics course is you get into some of the laws of orbital mechanics, Kepler's laws in particular. And so being able to learn that to the degree where I could teach others Help me get a better understanding of some of the fundamental, fundamental principle, phys, um, excuse me, physical principles that dominate the world of orbital mechanics. It was a challenge, uh, challenging training situation for the early astronauts, particularly when we started doing docking in Gemini and then on into Apollo, because it's counterintuitive. You know, to slow down, you need to go faster to rendezvous. It depends on where you at, are at, but it's all based on one of Kepler's laws where you sweep out equal areas in equal time. So depending on the height of your orbit, you figure out how to apply that. I will tell you that the space shuttle orbiter was a very amazing spacecraft when it was in space. It flew very precisely. So if you made a control input, it did exactly what you wanted to do. But once you understood kind of the basic concepts behind orbital mechanics, 
it was pretty straightforward to fly the vehicles. But always very fun to be part of a rendezvous, particularly as you got closer to the other spacecraft, because it's, you know, one point it's just this very dim point of light. As you get closer, you begin to see the individual modules. And I remember thinking on STS-86, it's like, you know, this is fascinating to me because there's just a handful of people who are off the surface of the planet right now. And we're about to join up together. And so maybe this is what it was like for the people who were part of the Oregon Trail and the wagon trains where they would go days and days and days without seeing any other sign of civilization. But there on the far horizon, they'd finally see evidence of a distant town and it would get closer and closer. And they realized there were gonna be other people that they could then talk to. So I always had that for my remaining uh, two rendezvous flights after SDS-86, I always had that thought come to mind that we were pioneers in the wagon train off the planet in this situation, giving an opportunity to meet with the other people who were off the planet. Dan also wanted to know if I was ever afraid in space and honestly, no, because we are so well-trained. We literally practice every situation that we can think of. And if we don't practice it, we at least have a plan in place that we can review. So oftentimes you're afraid because you don't know exactly what's gonna happen and your imagination fills in the details. Well, we try and keep that from happening. We're gonna practice all those details so we know exactly what to expect. And our simulators, outstanding. I remember on my last mission, I got to fly the space station robotic arm and I was in front of the robotic workstation in the NASA lab. And I remember looking at it thinking, this is just like the simulator. I feel like I'm back on earth in front of the simulator. I've done this before, I can do this again. All right, Dan, you're on a roll. This is great, I love them. Uh, as a woman, how was your training different? And did I experience discrimination as being the only female? You know, Dan, I'm actually glad you brought this up because this is not a subject that I talked about. But let me explain a little bit more about how NASA chose astronauts for the Shuttle Mir program. One of the things that NASA had learned from Apollo Soyuz is the Russian people have a great reverence for people who've flown in space. And NASA realized that it would be very beneficial to select astronauts for Shuttle Mir who'd already had spaceflight experience. And I will honestly tell you, back in the mid 90s, um, Russian culture discriminates against women. Uh, the men are firmly in charge, or at least that's the way it was back then. And so it was challenging to be a woman in that society. And so NASA was a little concerned about that, but by virtue of the fact that I had flown in space, that really trumped everything. That I did not face uh, a lot of discrimination because once people realized that I was a space flyer, they afforded me a lot of respect. So I think that made my life easier. Now, was the equipment designed for somebody my size? No. And, you know, again, that as a woman is a situation you tend to encounter more frequently. And so that was challenging for me to try and figure out those workarounds. All right. Well, I'm sad to say that this has to be the final question. Thank you, Zach. Another uh, go for launch student. Uh, when I was in space, let's see, did you learn anything that made your time in space easier? Um, there are a few things I would say that are really challenging to train for down on Earth because we just don't have a way to simulate extended weightlessness for a time. So I mentioned riding the rocket, you just have to experience that because yeah, you can't simulate 6.5 million pounds of thrust. Being weightless all the time. There is definitely a learning curve associated with that. And yes, I'd done time on uh, the zero G aircraft. 30 seconds of weightlessness though does not prepare you to be weightless 24 seven. So my first day in space, I call it flying ugly. I was not coordinated at all. Gradually, I kind of bought a clue and figured out, ah, center of mass. I now know where the force is gonna react through. I know how to position my body, how to push off, how to relax and glide. So. That was definitely the learning curve I had to experience, but once I figured it out, that was a lot of fun. And yes, I remembered that for my next mission and subsequent missions. So yeah, there are some things that you've got to learn on that first space flight 
to be better prepared for the subsequent ones. Well, I wanna thank you all again for taking time out of your day to join me for this virtual event. Uh, always fun for me to share this story. And I really hope that what you take away from it is there are a lot of amazing things that we can do together as humans when we choose to focus on what we have in common, when we choose to put aside those perceived differences, when we choose to collaborate. And yes, the space station is a great example. It's a marvel of engineering, but we all have that capacity within us. So that's the encouragement and the challenge that I would leave with you, particularly during these times. Let's focus on what we have in common and let's work together to accomplish some of those amazing things. Thanks again for joining me.